everyone. So in today, we're going to be looking at water pollution control, right? So how do we manage and what are some of those solutions to those sources of water pollution that we talked about in the previous lecture? So in 1969, the Cuyahoga River caught on fire. Now, it's not the actual water that was burning, right? But it was all the uh, chemicals and petroleum-based waste that had been discharged into the water over the years that were on fire. And sadly, this is not the only river that has caught on fire in American history. There's at least a dozen documented river fires, the Buffalo River, the Schuylkill. Um, and this is not the first time that the Cuyahoga River caught on fire. The, the picture that you see there is actually taken from an earlier river fire that occurred in the 1950s. Now, what happened after this fire is that Time Magazine wrote an article in which they included this earlier photo, and they labeled the Cuyahoga as the river that oozes rather than flows, which I think is a great description. Why this is important is because this kind of sparked national outrage, and this galvanized politicians to pass legislation to address the poor water quality that existed in the United States. So it led to the passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972. And this act was later updated and reauthorized in 77, 81, and 87. And it had three specific goals. To make all U.S. waters fishable and swimmable by 1983, to have zero water pollution discharge by 1985, and to prohibit discharge of toxic amounts of toxic pollutants. Well, how is it going to address this? Well, it, one of the first things that it did is it established the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. And this is a permit system that would require industrial facilities, uh, municipal governments, and some agricultural facilities, such as feedlots, to obtain permits to discharge uh, into surface waters. And these would be point source discharges. Remember that point source is where that discharge is coming from a specific location, such as an effluent pipe, right, from maybe some sort of industrial manufacturing plant or an effluent pipe from a uh, wastewater treatment plant, right? So in order to discharge waters from those point sources, these industries uh, would need to obtain a permit. And that permit, as part of that, would place discharge limits, right? So it would limit the amount of pollutants that could be discharged. Now, those limits were based or are based on the best available technology. So what this means is that they, the EPA, which is managing this um, in partnership with state and environmental agencies, would look at what is the best available technology right now, right? What technologies do we have to clean up and address these pollutants? and then base their limits on that, right? So, so essentially they were trying to make it reasonable uh, for these uh, entities to clean up their water, right? Not make it too stringent or too lax. So that's one of the, the main things that the Clean Water Act did, right? And that, that went uh, a, a good way towards addressing some of these pollutants. Another important thing that the Clean Water Act did is that it financed municipal sewage treatment. As, as we talked about in the prior lecture, sewage and wastewater can be a significant source of water pollution from excess nutrients to metals to pathogens to pharmaceuticals and hormones now. So it can be a significant source of a number of water pollutants. And the Clean Water Act uh, provided financial assistance to start um, addressing these problems with sewage and wastewater in areas that didn't have municipal sewage treatment. So provided $54 million in federal funds through grants and loans. Uh, this was in conjunction with 128, oh, that should be $54 billion, I'm sorry. This is in conjunction with $128 billion in state and local funds that were raised as part of this a downside is that since 1994, there has been no additional federal funding for uh, municipal sewage treatment uh, work. So I want to take a moment and talk about sewage and wastewater treatment, right? And how, why municipal treatment is important and why it has been so helpful. So historically, American households had outhouses or pit toilets for waste disposal, right? You'd go out to your outhouse, do your business in there. It would essentially just fall into a big pit. 
Now, the problem with this is that that stuff would collect in the pit. There was the conditions in that pit weren't always suitable for a uh, natural breakdown of that waste. And some of that untreated waste could leach into the groundwater or into surface waters and contaminate drinking water. Now, a big step towards improving this was the uh, development of septic systems. Now, septic systems are effective where land is available, so there's space, and where population densities are low. And how a septic system works, um, some of you may have septic systems in your homes, is that your wastewater gets flushed, it gets stored initially or flows into a septic tank where it essentially settles out. There's some gas and scum that goes to the top, solid settle out to the bottom. And then the liquids are kind of in the middle, and those liquids then get moved out to a leach field where they will slowly leach into the ground and uh, the conditions are right for uh, microorganisms to break down any nutrients or organic material in that liquid uh, as it settles in the ground. And then uh, occasionally you need to get your, your septic tank pumped out, the solids in the, the scum layer on the top. Right. So this is a healthier way. It's, it's managing your waste a little bit better um, uh, by uh, collecting the particles that won't break down well and allowing the stuff that will break down well and allowing uh, creating conditions for microorganisms to properly break it down in your soil. Now, the problem does occur, though, is that these systems get old and they can start leaking, right? And it's, in fact, aging and leaking uh, leaky septic systems were a significant problem really around the country. Uh, as an example, in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, um, almost, uh, almost half a million individual septic systems were leaking or old or degraded. And they were constituting a major source of nutrients. And again, we talked about nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus being the big ones. And when there's that buildup of nutrients, it leads to that eutrophication, right? So there's buildup of algae and phytoplankton. They die, they get broken down by bacteria. That bacteria use oxygen and it creates these dead zones, right? Because it uses up all the oxygen in the water. Well, uh, those dead zones throughout much of Chesapeake Bay were, were the result of excess nutrients that were being... Uh, um, added to the water through these leaky septic systems. Like I said, one of the big things with the Clean Water Act is that it uh, financed municipal wastewater treatment plants. And if you look at, we're going to watch a video on how uh, New York City or a plant in New York City manages its sewage, but there are a number of steps in wastewater treatment, right? So the wastewater gets pumped to the plant. When it's at the plant, there are, it first goes through primary treatment, where this is the physical separations of solids from the waste stream. So initially, it may run through some filters where it's going to, um, where those filters will take out larger solid particles, like maybe uh, toilet paper or nowadays a lot of wet wipes that aren't going to break down, and those get removed. And then there's some other physical settling that occurs. And then there's secondary treatment, which is just which is similar to um, our leach field in a sense. If you're talking about septic systems, where in that secondary treatment, you're you're utilizing biological degradation, right? So you're using uh, bacteria primarily that are going to break down the organic material in your sewage. There's actually regulations that require 85% removal of organic material before that could then later be discharged. And another thing to be aware of is something called biological oxygen demand, right? So just like in those dead zones with eutrophication that we talked about, our bacteria require oxygen to metabolize and live. So if there's more organic material, there's going to be more uh, bacteria and they're going to need uh, more oxygen to uh, break down that material. So that's something that people measure in the wastewater treatment is this biological oxygen demand. So they go through primary treatment secondary treatment, and then there's a disinfection stage where they either use UV light or chlorine or ozone to treat that uh, processed wastewater and to remove pathogens, and then it is discharged to a waterway. So let's take a look at how this occurs in this quick example.
New York City has 14 wastewater treatment plants. In total, we treat about 1.3 billion gallons per day. There are about 8.5 million people in New York City. Uh, all of their wastewater is treated at one of the 14 plants. Here at Newtown Creek, the service area is about 1.1 million people. This plant here at Newtown Creek, though, is the largest of the 14 plants. It treats, on average, about 225 million gallons a day. We receive sewage from parts of Brooklyn, a little bit of Queens, and actually almost the entire uh, east side of Manhattan and lower Manhattan. We're right now at the lowest level of the facility, about 50 feet below street level, where the raw, untreated sewage enters the plant. We have the sewage passed through a series of metal bars that are spaced about an inch apart, and those bars remove anything that may get into the sewer system that could clog up pumps or other equipment. A lot of the material we do see are sanitary wipes, which, unlike toilet paper, really don't break down in the sewer system. So occasionally things wash up on the screens that shouldn't be in sewer systems. Fish, we get turtles, we get dollar bills from time to time. A few years ago there was a firearm that uh, came onto the screens. NYPD got involved with, with that. A lot of things that are in sewage can't be physically or mechanically removed. They have to be removed in other methods. So we remove that material here at what are called the aeration tanks. Uh, and in these tanks, we cultivate microorganisms that are naturally occurring, and they actually consume organic material that's in sewage, and that's part of the, what we call the biological treatment process here at the plant. We're now at a part of the process called the final settling tanks. Organic material that has now been consumed by microbes is heavy enough where it can settle to the bottom of these tanks and be physically removed for later processing. Obviously, treating sewage from a million people uh, can be odorous, so we do a lot of odor control here at this plant. All of the tanks are are essentially covered where there can be odors, and that odorous air that are trapped under the covers passes through activated charcoal, which removes a lot of the odor-causing materials. The organic material that we remove from the wastewater is called sewage sludge, and we now have a couple of processes for that material. One of them is called thickening. We're at the top of one of the eight egg-shaped digesters here at the plant. We're about 140 feet in the air. It gives you a good view of the city. The purpose of digestion is fairly simple. We want to take the organic material that's in the sewage sludge, fats, proteins, carbohydrates, and break them down into more basic components like carbon dioxide, water vapor, and methane gas. And that's done here in these digesters. You see here, this is the last step uh, in the process. We've added bleach to the wastewater, and it's leaving the plant at this point and going down to an outfall that releases the treated sewage into the East River. There are federal regulations that require all wastewater treatment plants in the country to remove at least 85% of the organic material that comes into a plant. This plant generally removes between 92 and 95 percent of the material, so we do better than federal standards. Okay, so there you could see that in action, the process. So while um, wastewater treatment plants are effective in removing organic matter, they are not effective at removing inorganic nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus nor are they great at removing pharmaceuticals or other related compounds. Now, there are additional treatment um, steps that can be added to that process, but they're not uh, required in all places. They're not done in all places, and they cost extra money. But another step that you could be utilized is to utilize nature, particularly wetlands, at these outfall locations. And this is something we refer to as green infrastructure, and we're going to see it again um, when we look at addressing non-point source pollution. So I'll save that for now, and we'll talk about it in a little bit uh, when we start talking about non-point source pollution. Oh, there we go. So what can you do to um, minimize your impact to sewage and wastewater, um, and ultimately that sewage and wastewater that is going to be treated and then discharged, right? Well, one of the things is don't flush your medications, right? We just said how 
uh, wastewater treatment isn't good at uh, eliminating pharmaceuticals, so don't flush your medications. There are um, programs in place in a number of places. There are drop-off boxes that take back where you can drop off excess meds. They're often found at police stations. If you Google it, you could find locations. Don't flush your baby wipes. Um, this is, while they say they are flushable, the problem that people in the wastewater treatment uh, industry will say is that they don't break down. So they get, uh, they pile up, they can clog the machinery. Uh, essentially, they make everything uh, work less efficiently. So um, try not to use baby wipes as nice as they feel. Uh, maybe just don't flush them then. Um, compost your waste instead of using uh, a garbage disposal. So I had a garbage disposal in my first apartment. I freaking loved it because it was so convenient. But really, ideally, um, the excess organic material that is going to contain nutrients, etc., that you are putting down ultimately into your wastewater or into that wastewater stream uh, is adding that extra uh, material that needs to be broken down or the extra nutrients that otherwise could be removed from the system. So a better way of dealing with your waste or your waste material is to compost. And there are a number of different uh, types of composting that could be done. I'll touch on them again a little bit briefly when we look at non-point source pollution. Uh, likewise, similar to that with the garbage disposal is don't pour your grease down the drain either. Um, use phosphate-free dish detergent. So uh, phosphates, right? That phosphorus is that uh, one of those really important nutrients that leads to that eutrophication. It's it's one of the limiting nutrients that prevents the growth of algae, uh, particularly in freshwater environments. Um, so any excess phosphates that's added to the wastewater is going to add that phosphorus into your water system could lead to those problems. Uh, in 2010, 17 states banned phosphates in dish detergent. Now, New Jersey is not one of those 17 states. However, as a result of this, a lot of manufacturers did largely remove phosphates in response, right? Because it would be too difficult for them to manufacture uh, a phosphate uh, dish detergent and a non-phosphate dish detergent and to sell them to the different states, right? So they kind of just started uh, removing phosphates in response to this thing. Now, you could still get uh, dish detergent with phosphates, but you really shouldn't use it because of that nutrient problem uh, that I talked about, right? So make sure you're using a phosphate-free dish detergent. And really, this stuff followed along with a ban on phosphates and laundry detergent that was enacted much earlier in 1994. So those are some of the things that you could do to help address some of these issues associated with sewage and wastewater treatment. Now, returning back to the Clean Water Act, right, financed a lot of that municipal wastewater treatment, and that went a long way in addressing our sewage and wastewater problem and the nutrients and pollutants associated with that. Another important thing that the Clean Water Act did is that it protected wetlands through Section 404, and that essentially put um, uh, regulations in place to protect waters of the United States. Now, there is a continual debate, and there's often litigation over waters of the, what waters of the United States means. Right. And what is the regulatory limit of that? We it has been interpreted to uh, to include um, wetlands, right, as waters of the United States. But um, depending on the political climate or who's in charge, et cetera, there has been more loose interpretations of that to include uh, all wetlands, right, and, and essentially any sort of wetland that is connected to any uh, any sort of other water, or to be very stringent and restrict that definition. So again, there's a continual debate about uh, the regulatory limit of the Clean Water Act in terms of wetland protection, but it has protected wetlands in general. And this is important because as we're gonna see with that green infrastructure, nature and wetlands and plants can go a long way to addressing some of these pollutant problems by the actions that they do naturally. Right? In particular, when we're talking about wetlands, there's a number of benefits. Um, they will slow stormwater. They will, the plants will take in excess nutrients that they will use to grow and they will store in their bodies instead of those nutrients going into your, your water. Uh, they will slow that water and they will trap sediment that otherwise could be flowing into our waters and causing problems with turbidity or excess nutrients as well. So a number of uh, great benefits that wetlands provide um, 
in terms of water pollution, and that's just not touching on the other stuff that they do. Um, so they, it's important that we do protect them. And the Clean Water Act has um, facilitated that. Now, for those benefits, there were some issues with the Clean Water Act. And one of the big ones is that it did not address or does not address non-point source pollution. Right. It does a great job with our source or point source pollution right through that permit system. But it didn't address non-point sources. And as we've learned, non-point sources are a uh, significant contributor to water pollution. And these are agricultural runoff or runoff from industrial areas or urban areas. Now, um, the Water Quality Act of 1987 did address some of this, right, because they realized there was a failing here. And what this did is that it made industrial stormwater and municipal storm sewer systems, it defined them as point sources now and required them to get that MPDES permit. And in order for to obtain that permit, our municipalities needed to develop stormwater management plans. And these plans address essentially how they're going to deal with stormwater. So um, how they would deal with construction site runoff, which is that significant contributor to turbidity, right, and sediment runoff how they would address illicit discharges, uh, pollution prevention. They should have a public education piece. They should be able to evaluate the effectiveness of their program. And they should establish total maximum daily loads, which is the amount of certain pollutants that can be discharged into waters that are classified as impaired. So in order to get this permit, they needed this stormwater management plan, or they needed to develop this stormwater management plan. So how has the Clean Water Act, has it worked, right? Has it been effective? Well, surface water quality in the United States has significantly improved since its implementation. We've seen increases in dissolved oxygen levels, decreases in fecal coliform levels, and a number uh, and the number of rivers safe for fishing have increased by 12 percent since its implementation. And you can see some pictures. Those are taken from uh, 1973, so the year right after the passage of the Clean Water Act. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find. Um, many rivers that look like that or water bodies that look like that in the United States nowadays, right? That are even on that left there that are discolored by all that sewage and wastewater, which that is, or uh, look on the right there that uh, are, uh, although you can probably find places like that where are uh, so heavily polluted with trash and litter, et cetera. However, Water quality improvements have slowed since the initial improvements seen in the first three decades after passage of the Clean Water Act. And if we are looking at currently, about half of our rivers, streams, creeks, lakes, and ponds are still impaired or are classified as impaired. And about 26% of our bays, estuaries, and harbors, or miles of our bays, estuaries, and harbors, right? So we still have a lot of polluted water. I don't half, a little more than half of our water is still polluted. So why? Why have our improvements slowed and why do we still see such impairments? Well, one of the big reasons is, as we kind of already looked, our Clean Water Act was very lax on non-point source pollution, which is a significant source. So it didn't really address that. Another problem is that it failed to update technology-based limits for water pollution control systems, right? When we talked about those, the permits, right, the permit system and the the discharges that are allowed in that effluent, the, the levels of pollutants that are allowed, were to be based on the current technology. So what is available to us with our current technology, how much we could remove, that is essentially what we're basing our limits on. Well, two-thirds of those standards haven't been updated in 30 years. And what this means is that more pollutants are getting into waterways from oil refineries and chemical plants than should be. Right. We have better technology now. We have technology that allows us to uh, clean our effluent or clean that discharge water more than we could in the past. And we should be updating our standards to address this. But we're not. Now, some of that is related to that that next um, uh, sentence that I have up there. Right. There have been budget cuts to the EPA and state agencies. So we're when there are budget cuts and loss of personnel, right? It's, it's hard to keep up with these things that need to get updated. We've also seen a failure of governments to enforce those permit requirements, right? So these organizations need to establish or get these permits. They're not always enforced uh, and there's not always making sure that they are uh, abiding by those regulations. So all these things have affected the effectiveness of the Clean Water Act. 
And there is concern that maybe the Clean Water Act is too costly. Now, 20 recent studies found that the costs of the Clean Water Act outweigh the benefits. And you can see the link here to an article that talks about it. However, these studies may be discounting multiple factors, including improvements to public health or reduction in industrial chemicals not included in current water quality testing, right? So when they are doing these cost benefit analyses, they may be discounting a lot of the benefits that we are seeing um, with the Clean Water Act, right? That are, aren't being included in those analyses. And additionally, is there an inherent value in just having clean streams, just an existence value of having clean streams. And this kind of goes back to one of our first lectures where we talk about how we value the environment, right? Is it only about utilities and only about what we can get from streams or we can get from water? Or should we just have clean water on this earth? And is it worth the cost, right? Even if the benefits and maybe the returns in terms of recreation and fishing or um, boating, et cetera. Maybe if those returns don't outweigh the costs, right? Maybe those costs are worth it just to have clean water. So something to consider. Now we're gonna end uh, this lecture and the last part of this lecture is going to talk about non-point source pollution, right? Because that the Clean Water Act, while it went a, a large way to addressing point source pollution, it didn't really address non-point source pollution. So how do we do that nowadays? Well, our main sources of non-point source pollution, uh, we can kind of separate it into agriculture and then stormwater runoff that's occurring in um, our cities, urban areas, even suburban areas, et cetera. So if we're talking about agriculture, there has been a shift towards more sustainable agriculture, and there's different names for it, sustainable agriculture, agroecology, permaculture, but they're all focused on reducing the environmental impact of agriculture. So if we want to um, reduce uh, soil runoff, right, loss of topsoil that could lead to sediment and nutrients in it, if we want to reduce our application of our fertilizers, we need to take better care of our soil health and really foster our soil health. So we need to farm the soil, right? And there are a number of ways we can do this. One of which is we wanna disturb the soil as least as possible, because what's happening is your soil environment, it's an ecosystem in there, and there are numerous millions of organisms that are um, all interacting. And these are bacteria and fungi, um, invertebrates, nematodes, they're all living in your soil. And this interaction in their interaction in that ecosystem uh, ultimately fosters better soil, right? And when you disturb it through tilling, you disturb that ecosystem. So these organisms aren't able to function as properly. They're not able to break down organic material into nutrients that your plants could use. Um, and as a result, you get less fertile soil and you need to apply more fertilizer. So by farming for your soil, by disturbing your soil less through no-till uh, processes, by keeping your soil always covered to reduce erosion and add additional organic material, uh, by composting, um, by companion planting and taking advantage of the benefits of multiple plants being planted together, you can improve your soil health and reduce your reliance on fertilizers. Uh, by conserving water and changing your irrigation practices, you can reduce your runoff that otherwise could be occurring. Drip irrigation is a, a process by which you run tubing down your field, um, and there are uh, little holes essentially in that tubing at specific locations that allow uh, a small amount of water to drip into your soil directly into the root system or near the root system of your plants. So you're able to conserve water, which is important. You're also able to reduce that runoff that otherwise could be taking with it sediment particles and excess nutrients. And then you can utilize integrated pest management if we're trying to reduce our herbicides and our pesticides, right? So this is uh, a number of agricultural practice practices that you could adopt to uh, manage your pests, right? And this to, it can includes a number of things from the time of sowing to crop rotation to intercropping to fostering biodiversity to using biocontrols, right? So maybe wasps uh, to address some of your or some of your pests, etc. 
And again, the idea behind this is to um, reduce your reliance on pesticides or herbicides by using these uh, practices instead. So all of these are ways that we can address non-point source pollution coming from our agriculture, um, coming from our agricultural practices, right? How do we address non-point uh, non point source pollution in more urban areas, right? We're dealing with our stormwater runoff. Well, we're going to use nature. It's one of our best ways to do this. And it's that green infrastructure that I've already hinted at. And like I said, this is where we are utilizing plants and wetland plants to um, address this pollution before it starts flowing into our water bodies. Now, our wetlands and our wetland plants are amazing at a number of things, one of which is they take up these excess nutrients. So they're going to take up that nitrogen and that phosphorus that otherwise could be flowing into our water, and they're going to use it to grow. They're going to slow that water and they're going to trap sediment. So they're going to prevent some of that sediment from flowing into your water bodies that could be carrying excess nutrients as well. Right. They're going to allow water to infiltrate into the ground to recharge groundwater. Right. They're going to prevent it. The buildup of water from uh, running into your streams, which could cause more erosion. So there's a number of benefits that are happening or that happen from green infrastructure. And as a result, we have a number of different techniques. And as we're going to see in the next lecture in New Jersey, green infrastructure is now the priority way of addressing stormwater runoff. And it has been adopted into the stormwater runoff rules. So if you are going to um, do any sort of. Uh, development or any sort of work where you need to manage stormwater runoff, uh, you need to adopt green infrastructure. So what are some of the ways that we could do, or what are some of these examples of green infrastructures? Well, we have our rain gardens right here, right, where you're essentially planting uh, uh, a wetlands or uh, wetlands and different wetland plants to address some of your stormwater runoff. There are vegetative roofs or green roofs now have the same uh, same processes in place, right? They're addressing some of these problems, these nutrient problems, uh, pollution problems, before that water is uh, diverted into a storm drain or stormwater management drain. Forest pavement, right? Instead of having uh, all this water flow into from our parking lots flow into a, a storm drain, uh, porous pavement allows it, you can see it's extremely porous, right? It allows that water to flow through that pavement into the groundwater. Uh, wetlands at these discharge or effluent points, right? There, um, you can refer to them as pocket wetlands or even larger wetlands at these effluent points, right? Are going to address that water before it goes into a larger water body. Or even floating wetland islands. So in some of our lakes and our ponds, we can establish, um, essentially it's a floating raft material and you plant your wetland plants in there and they do the same process of taking in some of these excess nutrients that you could be finding in your lakes. Uh, really cool, I did one of these projects for my job a couple of years ago. So all these sources of green infrastructure and all these sources of using nature to address uh, these water pollution problems that we're seeing. If we're talking about coastal environments, we also want to establish our coastal wetlands, right? Our marshes for the same benefits that we talked about. But another important aspect of our coastal water and our coastal water quality would be oysters or different bivalves, uh, mussels, and maybe more brackish areas, right? So they are filter feeders. So they're able to, they are taking in water and filtering out nutrients and other pollutants, potential pollutants, as they are feeding. So one oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day. Now, typically it's around 25, 50 is kind of the high point. And it's important to note that there used to be thousands of acres of oysters in New Jersey waters, right? In Barnegat Bay, uh, which is closer to where I'm from, uh, there were once 12,000 acres of oyster beds and pretty much all of them are disappeared nowadays. So by restoring some of these lost oyster beds and these uh, in various waters, uh, those oysters are going to filter that water and they're going to clean that water so they can be a, uh, they're going to help improve water quality in these areas. So again, just like with uh, wastewater treatment, right, what can you do to uh, alleviate some non-point source pollution? Well, um, you can establish rain gardens in your property or try and promote the use of rain gardens in areas around you. You can practice some water conservation that we looked at in last, utilize those rain barrels, 
right? Reducing the amount of water that's flowing into your stormwater system. Um, you can reduce your fertilizer and herbicide and pesticide use at your home or in your garden, right? You, if you are looking uh, more for uh, ornamentals, try planting native plants. They have often, our native plants are suited to the environment better, right? Because they have, have evolved in this environment. So they often require less water or fertilizer or have uh, pesticides because they have natural uh, defenses. So look for native plants to plant. Uh, if you are looking to plant for, like I said, ornamentals, utilize composting for your garden instead of fertilizer. There's a lot of different types of composting. Thermophilic is probably the most common, what you think of, right? It's just having your big compost bin, uh, but you can utilize worm composting, black soldier fly composting, bokashi composting. I'm not going to go into it all now. They're all different composting techniques that you can Google. I've done all of them except for the bokashi composting. Uh, but they all have benefits to them and, and cons as well. Uh, but you should investigate all of them. There, uh, I enjoyed. I particularly like doing the black soldier fly composting. Um, so you can compost uh, and then increase your biodiversity in your garden and your lawn for the same reasons um, that we talked about with agriculture. Right, increasing your biodiversity not only improves your soil health, but it will attract more insects. Some of which may be. Uh, beneficial insects that could reduce your potential uh, pests or pathogens that can occur. So all benefits that you can do to reduce your fertilizer, herbicide, and pesticide use. Maintain your vehicle, right? So um, uh, leaking oil and gas is uh, one of the contributors to pollutants that are coming off from the stormwater runoff. If you are maintaining your vehicle, preventing those leaks, you're going to prevent that excess oil or, or leaking oil, etc., from getting on the roads and getting into the water body. If you um, are a shooter, right, you go to outdoor ranges, use lead-free ammunition to prevent the leaching of chemicals from that ammunition. Uh, I think in a lot of, uh, I don't know the regulations now, I think in uh, outdoor ranges that are part of state parks or, or county parks, they are regulations now with requiring lead-free, but I'm not positive. Uh, but again, that's maybe more niche for the select people who like to shoot, but that is something to consider. Pick up after your dog. I've mentioned it before, but that's important uh, as a potential source of nutrients, as we saw in some in, uh, uh, in that city areas. Don't use salt to de-ice your driveway. That's a uh, significant source of chemicals, particularly chlorine, that could impact our waters. Uh, so there are non-chemical de-icers that you can use. I've seen people talk about organic or, or natural um, um, things as well, such as alfalfa meal uh, and sugar beet juice. Uh, kitty litter won't break down or won't uh, thaw out your ice, but it will give you some traction if you're worried about walking. And then lobby for, for all of these things as well, right? So um, lobby for green infrastructure and chemical-free solutions and wetland protection and restoration. Lobby seems kind of like a, uh, you know, there's a negative connotation with that word. But try and promote these things and talk about the importance of them, um, et cetera. So some of the ways that you yourself can address this stormwater pollution or non-point stormwater runoff. So that is it for the lecture. Um, if you've noticed, I did not address some things. I did not talk about plastic and waste because next week we're going to have a lecture just directly related to plastic pollution. Uh, and I didn't talk about some groundwater contamination uh, and controls to that because we're going to talk about that again next week in a separate lecture where we're looking specifically at groundwater uh, and toxic chemicals, et cetera. So that is it. I hope you guys enjoyed and I will see you at the next one.